All right, good morning. It's good to have everybody here with us today. We are excited to be in the room with those of you that are here and online with those of you watching at home or wherever you are at. I think one of the beautiful things about being able to watch online is you don't have to be in your house. So some of you could secretly be sitting on the beach, which we're all envious of, right? Uh, so we want to uh, uh, jump into week three of our series, Abide. We've been in 21 days of prayer, and uh, if you were able to get a copy of the prayer uh, guide that we put out at the beginning, uh, we, you will know that that devotional was actually written by uh, a young lady in our church, Kat Floyd. And I asked Kat while she was in the process of writing that if uh, she would be willing to share one Sunday. And uh, Kat had come to me a couple of years ago and told me that she felt a call on her life into ministry and ultimately into even speaking. And so I think today is going to be her first uh, time doing this. So if you guys yeah. will make Kat feel welcome online and in the room. Hey. Hello, everybody. Pardon me while I get the mic situated. I just tried to turn it on down in the room and we got some feedback, so I had to quickly mute it again. So I think we're all right. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Great. So like you said, my name is Kat um, and I'm old school. I, uh, I do have a digital version of my notes, but I like a uh, paper copy. Does anyone else like paper copy? Yeah, Carmen. Okay, cool. Dylan. So I've got my hard covered bar card cover Bible and my physical notes that I'm going to be referencing today. Um, so my name is Kat. I've been at the church for quite a while. Um, I think I joined in 2011, so it's uh, been a minute for me. Um, and I had the pleasure to write the prayer guide, so I hope that you all have been enjoying it. If you didn't get a copy of it, I'd love to get you one so you can see me after if you're online, you can email me at cat at citychurch.life, um, and I hope that it's been blessing with you, blessing you in your life. Um, if I wanted to start today just by explaining my heart behind the prayer journal and explaining my heart behind the series, because this series is based on the journal that we we are following right now in our 21-day season of prayer. So. Jim's been sharing this. Uh, woo, this thing just vibrated in my hands when I hit the slide. That threw me off. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this series and the journal is based on this verse in John chapter 15, verse 4. So it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And this I, I is a, or this me that's speaking, that's a Jesus speaking. So, this word abide that we named the prayer journal in the series, uh, if you've been at City Church for any length of time, you know that we are really intentional about defining words for you, as we believe that the Bible was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. It wasn't written in English, right? So we're really intentional about defining words and seeing what did they mean in the original language and what does that mean for us today? So um, this word in the original Greek is meniate, and this means to remain, to stay, or to wait. So this word abide, when Jesus is saying abide in me, he's saying to wait with me, to remain with me, or to stay with me. And when I was writing this prayer journal, I really wanted to give you guys like just a little piece of scripture and a little devotional, some time to have you daily take time to remain with God every day, to have, encourage you to take time to stay with God each day and to wait with God each day. So that was like our heart behind the journal. So even if it's just 10 minutes a day, you're sitting down and you're getting before God, praying and remaining with him. So, you know, we're really intentional with words. What you may not know is we are just as intentional with our graphics, right? Every week, Jim's graphics are branded, his slides are branded, um, and I get kind of like an inside look to this because I'm married to Robert, who's our creative director, and he leads a team 
of wonderful designers and like photographers and video designers. Um, our video person's birthday was Friday, by the way, Simon Stevens. So if you're on the Facebook chat right now, can you just like give Simon a happy birthday? So tell him that we appreciate him and we love him and say happy birthday, Simon, woo. Okay, anyway, but so we're super intentional with like the words that we use and making sure that you understand why we use the words that we use, but we're also really intentional with the images that we use. So this is our graphic. This is also the cover of the prayer journal. Um, and Robert chose this graphic because it's like this picture of stained glass, right? And he got the inspiration from 13th century cathedrals. And I'm taking like a little bit of time to tell you the why behind the what, um, because I think it's really powerful. And when he explained it to me, I thought it was so cool. So I really want you guys to get this before I start the message. So in the 13th century cathedrals, um, they used stained glass to teach like the illiterate congregation the Bible stories, but they also used it to like transform the light in the space. So when the light went through the colored glass, it actually changed, like it made the inside space, it transformed the inside space into like this ethereal feeling, like heavenly space. So when you walked into this cathedral, you felt like you were going into the space where God resided, and you felt like you could actually like abide, remain, stay with God. So it enhanced like your experience, right? So we wanted to put this picture of stained glass on the front of the journal, so that way we could be leading you into this environment that you are creating for yourself, where you could remain with God, stay with God, and wait with God, where you're creating an environment for yourself, where every day you could create an environment that was where God resided with you. So today, what I wanna encourage you to do is maybe you haven't been following along in the prayer journal, and that's okay, and maybe you missed a couple days, maybe you're behind or whatever, you know, there's no like set start date, like we started all together on one date, but God doesn't have a, this is the day that you start praying. This is the day that we end prayer. Like, I just want to encourage you to take some time to remain with God. And it says that his mercies are new every day, and he is so excited to remain with you, to stay with you, to be with you. So I just want to take some time at the beginning to tell you why we're doing this series, why, like my heart behind the journal, Robert's heart and intentionality behind creating this cover and encourage you to take some time this week to remain with God every day, even if it's for 10 minutes, for longer, whatever, just stay with God. And he is so excited for you to come back to him and to be with him. So that's how I want to start today. I want to go to God in prayer and pr yeah, in prayer and prepare our hearts for what we're going to say today. So Heavenly Father, just thank you. Thank you for the word that you've given us, and thank you for the things that you've given me to say, and I pray that even now in this moment, as people may be signing on, I pray for the people that are physically in this space, that you're preparing the hearts of the people that you've put here. I pray that you send your Holy Spirit down into me to speak directly through me into whatever the situations might be going on in the people that you've put here. I pray that you help my words go directly into the hearts and minds of the people here. I pray that you just stir the hearts of your people and bring them back towards you. And I pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So if this is your first week, I wanted to tell you a little bit about where we've gone so far. So I wanted to recap kind of like what Jim has um, said so far. This is week three, as he said when he introduced me. So. In week one of this series called Abide, he kind of talked about like, why do some Christians, why don't they pray? So he laid out two reasons why Christians may not pray, why people who believe God and believe in his power don't pray. So the first one right here, it says we have authority. And he says that, you know, Christians who believe that God is all powerful, you know, they think, you know, God's gonna do what he's gonna do. And therefore I may not need to pray because he's already gonna do it. But when we pray, like we have access into the authority that God, that all-powerful authority that God has. 
And then the second reason why God's pray, why people don't pray to God is because they say, well, God's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that is absolutely true. But we see, we get glimpses of his nature in scripture. And we see in scripture that there is evidence that, you know, people of God can go to him in prayer and God changes his mind. And if that's something in his nature and he's unchanging, then we know that we can change God's mind too if we go to him in prayer. And then last week, in week two, we talked about spiritual warfare. So Daniel, or Pastor Jim, taught on Daniel chapter 10, and he talked about there is a real spiritual warfare happening in the heavenly spaces, that there are evil spiritual spirits at work. Um, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So there's this war happening. But the good news is that we have a prince, and our prince wins. So it was meant to be an encouraging message. So if you feel like you are struggling with spiritual warfare, if you feel like there's opposition coming against you when you're praying, I'd highly encourage you to go back to listen to week two of Abide, or last October we did a series called What's in the Upside Down, and it's all about spiritual warfare. So those are two really great resources for you. And this week, I'm also going to be teaching on Daniel 10, coincidentally, or not because God doesn't do coincidences, but this week, I'm going to be talking about there's power in the process. And last Saturday, I was reading through Daniel 10, and I was just kind of like struck by Daniel's actions. And this is a chapter that's all about... Um, that gives us a glimpse into what's happening in the spiritual realm while we're praying. But I was really, God kind of showed me what's going on with Daniel, like what Daniel was doing during the spiritual warfare. So that's really what I want to focus on today. What was Daniel's process of prayer like during this time of like upheaval in the spiritual realm? So today, that's what I'm going to talk about. So if you have a paper Bible like me, and you want to turn there. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 11. And while y'all are flipping or tapping, if you're a digital person, um, I'm going to give you some context. So Daniel's chilling on this riverbank with some men. And we don't really know who the men are or how he knows them. But we know that he's there. And he gets this vision. Now Daniel has been praying and fasting for 21 days. And he has this vision from God, and it's of this man that's coming to him, and in verse 11, it's going to say he, the he is the man in the vision, so keep that, like, in your brains when we go. So here we go, verse 11, and he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved. I want to pause here for a minute and highlight that for you. It says, O Daniel, man greatly loved. Like, when you're praying, this is how God responds to you. Like, not only does God know your name because he made you in your mother's womb and he knitted you together, but he responds you, to you as like, oh, David, man greatly loved. Like, oh, Sophia, girl greatly loved. <laughs> I knew she would respond to me. That's why I called her name. Um, like, oh, cat, woman greatly loved. Like, whatever your name is, that's why he, he calls you, oh, person greatly loved. So this week as you're praying, I just want you to think about that. Like, this is how the God of the universe is calling you. And that's just so cool. Like, when I was reading last week, I just stopped and I, like, drew this out on a piece of paper. Because I just, like, was just struck by it. Like, this is the God of the universe. And this is how he talks to me. So that's cool. Okay, anyway. So, and he said to me, oh, Daniel, man greatly loved. Understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel. So from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. Verse 13. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, 
But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is yet to come. So last week, Jim told us that he pointed out that from the first day, our prayers have been heard. And then he focused on verses 13 and 14, which give us a glimpse into the spiritual upheaval that's happening, the opposition that's coming against us. But what I want to focus on is verse 12, right, where it talks about what Daniel is doing. And we know that God hears every prayer. We know that from the first day that we have prayed, God hears it. But we also know that God doesn't answer every prayer. And I don't know why God doesn't answer some prayers. We know that in James 4, it says that, you know, we ask and we do not receive because we ask with the wrong heart. So there is some context because sometimes we're asking for things that we shouldn't be asking for. You know, like sometimes if you're a parent, I don't have children, so I don't know. But like if you're a parent, sometimes your kid asks for something and you're like, no, like you cannot have that. But um, other times, you know, it may be a not yet. Or sometimes we ask for things that are good things with the right heart, but we're still told no. And I don't know why that is. But we know that he still hears it. He still hears it, and he still knows that we're praying for it. But he doesn't always answer it. But in this case, his answer was heard, right? His answer was, or his prayer was answered. And I think that there are two reasons why his prayer was answered. And that's what I'm going to tell you all about today. I'm going to go through and I'm going to dissect the two phrases in verse 12, which are what I think are the two reasons why Daniel's prayer was answered and why God sent his messenger to Daniel. Sound good? Yeah. I'm a middle school teacher, so like Daniel, or, um, whoa, I just forgot Dylan's name. I'm sorry. Um, I'm a middle school teacher, so like I expected y'all to answer me, but Dylan answered me. So thanks. So I'm going to go through verse 12, and I'm going to tell y'all what the two phrases are and explain like how I think we, what we can get from it. So verse 12 says, and then he said to me, fear not, Daniel. So from the first day that you set your heart to understand. So this is our first key phrase right here. Um, and remember earlier I said the Bible is written for us. So all of these phrases are written for us, but they weren't written to us. So this was written in Hebrew. So I'm going to show you how, like, what this meant in Hebrew. So this is called an interlinary, if you've never seen it before. An interlinary shows us, oh, I just hit the mic. An interlinary shows us the orange is the uh, translation that I was reading out of before. That's the ESV translation. The black is the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew that was written in. And the blue, that's like the, uh, it's written in with the English alphabet, but it's still the Hebrew word because they don't use our same letters. So it's like how you would pronounce it. Um, and they write the opposite way that we do. So they write it this direction, right? So it's reversed. So you set your heart to understand is the phrase that we're looking at. So this first word you set, natata, it means to give, to put, or to set. So that's pretty straightforward, right? Basically means the same thing in Hebrew and in English. The second word, lebeka, this word means it's heart, it's translated as heart. But when we look at the Hebrew word, it means like your inner will, your man, or your inner man, your will, or your mind. So that's like a different connotation, right? So when you're working, looking at this word, lebeka, in Hebrew, when they meant heart in Hebrew, that meant like their thinking. Like that's where they were, that's what we would talk about our mind. So it's a different connotation than we would think of today. So keep that in your brains for a second. And then the last word, lahabin, is to understand, or to, to discern. So very similar, right? Like thinking. So when we go back to the interlinary, you set your heart to understand. I want you to think about you set your mind to discern or to think. So what Daniel was doing when God's messenger said, you set your heart to understand, he was setting his mind to think about the things of God, right? 
I know it's big brain time. That's what my middle schoolers would call it. Like it's a lot of Hebrew, a lot of like translating. But Daniel was setting his brain to think about the things of God. And this reminds me of that verse in Philippians that Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 8 starting. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there, there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So Daniel was practicing thought replacement like centuries before thought replacement was a thing. And if you're unfamiliar with thought replacement, this is like a practice in therapy where they teach you to like take the destructive thoughts in your mind, the things that aren't healthy for your thought life, and replace them with the things that are healthy, the things that are worthy of praise, the things that are lovely, the things that are just, the things that are commendable, the things that are all of those things from Philippians 4, 8, right? So Daniel was replacing his mind during this 21-day season with things that were the Philippians 4, 8 things to think about. He was practicing a healthy thought life. Paul commands us, or he calls us to this type of thought life again in 1 Corinthians, um, oh, sorry, 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, starting in verse 3. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. So this is referring to spiritual warfare again. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And this is a verse that was like constantly told to me, like in times where I've been like struggling with like lies that I've believed about myself. And like, pers like people have told me like with full great intentions, like you just need to take every thought captive. Like you just need to like, and I'm like, cool. But like, how? Like what, what does that actually mean? And like, this is what it means. It means take that thought and compare it to the truth. And if it does not, if it's not the same, if they do not equal, then you replace it and you teach your mind, like you, you have like a mind script where you actually think the mind script, you say to yourself what is true, and you learn to stop saying to yourself what is not. So Daniel was practicing this thought replacement like centuries before we have like the modern therapist to like teach us how to do that, right? So this was the first thing that I think we can get from what Daniel's actions are. So my question for you today is like, what do you set your minds to think about? The majority of your day, what are, you, what are you saying to yourself? What are you saying to yourself about yourself? What are you saying to yourself about your situation? What, are, what types of thoughts are you thinking about? Are those thoughts, do they align with Philippians 4? Um, or do they not? And if they don't, maybe write yourself a mind script or memorized Philippians 4, so that way you can start to reroute your thought life. So that's the first phrase that I think we can get from Daniel 10, 12. We're going to come back to Daniel 12, 10, 12 and look at the second. So it says, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and that you humbled yourself before your God. So this is the second piece. So after we have learned to change our thought process, we have to learn to humble ourselves before our God. And here we can see the Hebrew word for humble. And I'm going to humble myself and tell you guys that I have no idea how to pronounce this. So I'm not going to try. But if we have some Hebrew scholars that can give it a shot, let me know. Hit me up after service. Or, hey, if you're in the uh, Facebook chat and you want to give it a shot, maybe uh, you can do that. And type it in the chat, but that wouldn't really be pronouncing it, but maybe you can like record yourself and put it in the chat. I don't know if that's possible, but anyway, so here you can see the uh, biblical or the Hebrew word for humbled yourself. And I love this definition of humbled yourself because it's to be occupied with. 
I think a lot of the times when we hear the word um, humbled, it's a negative connotation, right? You think of like thinking less of yourself. But when we get the definition of being occupied with, you're actually thinking of yourself less, right? Same words, it's just reversed. So when you're becoming occupied with God, because that was the next verse, or that was the next word in the verse, you're thinking of yourself less often, right? You're occupied with God instead of occupied with yourself and your abilities. So, and that kind of reminds me of like the Philippians 2, 3. I didn't put it in here. I'm just going to read it to you. It says, do nothing out of selfish, selfish ambition, but in humility count others more significant to your, than yourselves. And I think this is a great picture of humility, like becoming occupied with God first and then with others, like counting others before yourself. So I'm going to go through some evidence of calls to humility. We're going to start in 2 Chronicles 7, so if you are a physical Bible person, you can go ahead and flip there, and I'm going to tell you um, some context, because I like context. So in 2 Chronicles 7, uh, King Solomon who is the child of King David, he had just built the temple. And this was like a huge deal. Like for us, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but it was really big because this was the first temple. Like prior to this, God's like physical manifestation on earth has just been like chilling in a tent and like going around. So um, this was a really big deal. And Solomon, King David, actually wanted to build the temple, and he had acquired the land to build the temple, but God said no because of the sin that was in his life. So then Solomon, his son, got to build the temple. So Solomon was going to build the temple, and he had just finished dedicating it to God, and he did that earlier on in chapter 7, and this is where we're picking it up. So this is the Lord's response to Solomon. He's, like, telling him, like, hey, good job. So here we go. Chapter Seven, verse 12. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. So he's like, I listened to you, and this is going to be my place. Verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So regardless of what hardships may come to you, you are my people and I will hear your prayer if you humble yourselves, turn from your wicked way, and pray to me. Like, that is such a big promise to make, right? I think so. Okay, verse 15. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. Verse 16. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name will be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. So God is saying, like, this is my chosen place. This is the place where my eyes will be attentive and my ears will hear the prayers that are coming from here. And I just think that that is so cool, right? Like, he's saying, like, this is the place that I have chosen, and I'm going to hear the prayers that are coming from here. And what's so beautiful about this picture to me is that now that Jesus has come and that Jesus has died on the cross for us and that he has been resurrected, you and I are now God's temple. We are now the physical manifestation of God's spirit on earth. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, which is actually your version's um, Bible verse of the day on Friday, which was pretty cool. And I got really excited when I saw that. Anyway, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So we are now like the space where God's spirit dwells on, on earth. So when he's saying, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in, his, in this space, this promise to hear our prayers, he's talking about us. He's saying, I will hear the prayers that you make because you are my people. If 
we humble ourselves before him and pray. If we can humble ourselves, turn from our wicked ways and pray, he will hear it and he will answer it. So I want to remind you that, remember that humbling isn't this like negative, self-deprecating thing. It's being occupied with God. When you're self-deprecating, that's still being occupied with yourself. So that's still self, like it's still prideful, right? That's still false humility. So becoming occupied with God, that is true humility. And then I think like when you hear humility, I think we can also like think of a time when we were humbled, right? That's a different connotation. Um, I'm going to tell you all a story of when I was humbled. Is that okay? Uh, I was, uh, Carmen's laughing. She's heard the story. Um, I uh, was getting my mom's driver's license out for some reason. I don't know why. I don't remember why I was going through her wallet. She needed her driver's license, and she told me to get it for her. So I was getting it out for her. Um, this is when I was still living with her, so I was, I was older than I should have been. I was like a child. Like, I was not a child. When you hear this story, you're going to think that I was a child, but I was like, I was like a teenager, like maybe 15, 14, 15, so I was older than, um, anyway, so I was getting her driver's license out for her, and I saw the word organ donor on it, and I thought that I was so smart and so funny, and I thought that I had this great comeback, so I looked at her, and I was like, what organs have you donated? Like, why do you get the word organ donor? And I, like, didn't even connect that, like, that meant that she would <laughs> donate her organs, like, if she ever... Like, if anything bad happened, she just looked at me, and she, I don't even remember what she said back to me, but I immediately just felt, like, so embarrassed. And, like, so, like, that is, like, being humbled, right? She's in the Facebook chat right now, so there's, there are many stories like this. She has a really good one, like, about a post office, so maybe if you ask her really nicely, she'll tell you about that one. Um, but anyway, so, like, that is, like, what being humbled is, right? It's, like, this embarrassing like thing that someone else puts on you, but I mean, you made, I made the choice to say something stupid, so, but anyway, <laughs> humbling yourself is a choice that you make. It's a choice that you make to become occupied with something else. So I just want to make that distinction here, that a lot of times when you read verses like this and you see the call to humility, you make this negative connotation with like, this experience that you've had where maybe you thought that you were maybe you're like me maybe you're not maybe you're better than me and you know what the organ donor on the, on the driver's license card means but maybe you have had an experience where you thought that you were like the biggest the best in the world and someone has come down and been like no um so maybe you have also been humbled in your life but this is not what we're talking about we're talking about you making the choice to acknowledge that your place and acknowledge God's place and acknowledge that God is the one who is, God is the one who runs the world. God is the one who is, should be, you should be submitting yourself to. So you are choosing to humble yourselves and submit yourself to his power. So this call to humility is not just found in the Old Testament. So I want to talk about two verses in the New Testament real quick and that we're going to look at. And these are both like really valuable teachings on prayer. Both of them are found in the prayer journal. So I'm not saying that they're not good teachings. I just want you to look at them in context. So the first is found in James 4, if you're flipping there, and the second is found in 1 Peter 5. And when we look at these teachings in context, you can see that there is a call to humility before there's this teaching on prayer. So the first one is found in James chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 6. And right here in verse 6, this author is actually alluding, he's uh, referencing a verse in Proverbs. I think it's Proverbs 3.34. So he's saying, therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And we're going to skip down to verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And this is like the super popular part of this, uh, this chapter that I think is 
taught on a lot, especially when we're talking to prayer. Like drawing near to God is something that, you know, we want and that is something that happens when we pray and when we humble ourselves and pray. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to joining, mourning and your joy to gloom. I'm like, no one ever talks about this verse when they're talking about draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So it's just so interesting to me that this popular teaching on drawing near to God and he will draw near to you is bookended, which means both sides, by this call to humility, by reminding yourself like, hey, be occupied with God by the things of God. Like, if there is sin in your life, like, get rid of it, repent of it, cleanse your hands. Like, if there's things that you're doing that grieves God's heart, allow it to grieve your heart too. And then humble yourself before God so he can exalt you. So there's this, when you look at this, draw near to God so he can draw you near to you in context, there's just so much more here to it that we don't always get the chance to see. Um, the other verse I want to talk about is 1 Peter 5, 7. And this one is this really beautiful, oh, I wanted to remind you here, I forgot, that humbling yourself is thinking of yourself less, right? Being occupied by God. But I did say that. I just forgot that I put a slide here. When I teach in school, I don't use slides. So this is like not what I usually do. Sorry, guys. So anyway, 1 Peter 5, 7 is the other verse I want to talk about. And this is this like beautiful verse about like give your anxieties to God right because he cares for you and he wants to take your anxieties but I want you to notice that this starts in the middle of a sentence and whenever like you're given a verse that starts in the middle of a sentence you should be wary and you should like notice that and then go see what happens right before it because you're not getting the whole picture and you're not getting the whole story so we're going to jump back to first Peter 5 verse 5 where it says, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that's that same proverb that James referenced in verse 6. Notice that. Um, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty God of God, mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. So he's saying, God wants to take your anxieties. He wants to take the burdens away from you and the worries away from you because we were not created to hold on to them. This is what a lot of last week's prayer journal was about, right? We weren't created to hold on to the anxieties that we hold on to. But before we can give him his anxieties, we need to become occupied with him. We need to humble ourselves underneath him so that we can give him our anxieties, so that we can cast our anxieties on him because he does care for us. So if you don't get anything else from these two verses, these two New Testament ideas, I want you to get that like, context is key. Like, look at verses in their context because you'll see that like these two teachings are telling us that before you humble or before you draw near to God, become occupied with him. Before you cast your cares on God, become occupied with him. Humble yourselves under God so that you can give me your anxieties, so you can give him your anxieties. Become occupied with God so you can draw near to him. So we're going to go back to Daniel 10:12 where it says Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand, that you fixed your mind on me, and humbled yourself before your God, so became occupied with God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. So the messenger was sent because of God, because of Daniel's words. God sent his messenger because Daniel fixed his mind on the things of God, and because he humbled himself before God, he became occupied on the things of God. And I think this is the formula that we can follow when we pray, right? If we 
can fix our minds on the things of God, if we can have a healthy thought life, and if we can become occupied with God, if we can hum humble ourselves before God, then we can trust that God will answer us and he will send his messenger to us. But we also know that our prayers aren't the whole story. In verse 13, we get this picture of the spiritual warfare that's happening in the heavenly realm. So I just want to reiterate again, if you feel like there's opposition against your prayers, if you feel like you are struggling with spiritual warfare, warfare we did a series on it last October called What's in the Upside Down. You can find it on our YouTube page. You can find it on maybe on our Facebook. You can definitely find it on our YouTube page. There's probably a link in the chat box in that you can get to it. Uh, but there is, uh, there are spiritual forces of evil working in the heavenly realms that are trying to stop your answer from coming to you. So in your prayer life, be praying against them, but also understand that like there, there are things that you can be doing in your prayer life against it. So my question for you with this in mind is, what would have happened if Daniel had stopped praying? I told you at the beginning that Daniel was chilling on the riverbank, right? And he had some guys with him. When the, uh, when the vision came down, right, in verses 1 through 10, Daniel fell on his face in fear. But the men who were with him, they just, like, ran away, right? They ran away and hid. They couldn't see the vision. They didn't know what was going on. But on some level, they knew something was happening because they ran. So I just wonder, like, what would have happened if Daniel had, like, prayed on day one and just been like, I gave it to God. I'm like, I'm done. Or if he had, like, gotten discouraged on day three or day five or day 20, right? This happened on day 21 of his prayer and, fa prayer and fasting. Uh, I feel like Daniel was positioning him to be in a place to hear the answer from God. He was posturing himself to hear from God, right? And in verse 1 of chapter, chapter 10, it said that, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed, revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar, Belshazzar, and the word was true, and it was the great conflict. And he understood the word, and he had understanding of the vision. So I wonder if Daniel had understanding of the word and understanding of the vision because he had been posturing himself for 21 days to hear from God. Like, those other men, like, peaced out, right? They just, like, left. But Daniel had understanding of the vision, and he had understanding of the word. He knew that this answer was from God. And I can't help but think, like, maybe he did that because he had been fixing his mind on God, and he had humbled himself before God. He had occupied himself with the things of God. So I wonder, what are you persistently praying for? Are you persistently praying for the things that burden your heart? And if you're not, I want to challenge you too. Um, Daniel isn't the only example of persistent prayers that we see in the Bible. We also have Hannah, who is a beautiful story. Um, it's in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, and it goes through to verse 10. We're not going to read it today because my fancy little timer says I only have 12 minutes left, so I would encourage you to read it on your own time. Um, the Persistent Woman in Luke 18, verses 1 through 7, also is a really great uh, chapter, to, or a really great story to read, so I'd encourage you to jot these down. These are both incredible examples of uh, persistent prayers in the Bible. So, that's Hannah in 1 Samuel 1, verse 1, chapters 2, verse 10, and the persistent woman in Luke 18, 1 through 7. And as I close today, I just want to end with a couple challenges for you. Uh, we're about to go into week three of the prayer journal, right? And so I just want to ask you, like, are you persistently praying for the things that, pray, that burden your heart? So 
in week three of the prayer journal. Each week of the prayer journal, I tried to like theme it on this overarching theme. And you don't have to read through this whole thing. This is actually just a screenshot of a page in the book. So if you don't have one of these books, you can see me after service. You can email me at cat at citychurch.life and I would love to get one of them into your hands. We have physical copies. We also have an e-pub version, which works on e-readers. Um, but this week, this last week of the prayer journal, it's entitled Pray With Power. And I just wanted each devotional to be surrounded by the idea that like, we have a direct link into the creator of the universe. Like when we are praying, we are praying to the guy who created the universe with like one word, right? And we have access to that power. So, I want to read a quote from you from a book that I recently read, and it's called The Circle Maker, and it's written by Mark Batterson, um, and it says, our most powerful prayers are hyperlinked to the promises of God. So that means like if you just like open this book, or the Bible, if anyone was wondering, um, to any random page, right? Like in the see what story is there, like the prayers that you pray are hyperlinked, which is like a link that you click and it takes you to a website. Um, to whatever story you're reading. Like, your the pray, prayers that you pray, that power is connected to the stories that you read. And you're able to pray that power of those stories into whatever situation you're facing. And I want you to encourage you to do that this week. So, this week as we close, I have two challenges for you. The first one is to follow along in the prayer journal. So, this last week, we have seven devotionals left, and they're all about praying big, bold prayers. And I want you to do that this week. Pray big, bold prayers. And I'm not just plugging it because I wrote it. I'm plugging it because the, it's not like a coincidence that both Jim and I taught on Daniel 10 this week. Like, I wrote the sermon on Saturday of last week. And I was supposed to actually tell Jim what I was preaching on so that we wouldn't preach on the same things, but I didn't. So we taught on the same thing. And we're about to start a series on Daniel, right? And these 21 days, like seasons of prayer, are based on Daniel chapter 10, this story that we just read, right? The story that Pastor Jim talked about last week, the story that I taught about this week. So. I think that God is doing something in this season. So I just want to encourage you to follow along in this last week of the prayer journal. The second challenge that I have for you today is to pray like big impossible things, right? So my slides are out of order, but it's okay. We're going to roll with it. It's fine. Um, so my second, uh, don't worry about it, Quinn. It's really not a big deal. Um, my second <laughs> challenge that I have for you is to pray big and possible things, and that's to, um, sorry, I got distracted. I'm the most distractible person in the world. Like, my kids at school know this. They'll, like, I'll see them, like, look at each other and, like, plan to distract me. Like, they'll make eye contact, and one of them will raise their hands, and I'll know like, I'll know that they're going to distract me, and I'll call on them anyway, and they'll be like, do you want to hear what my dog did last night? And in my head, I'll be like, no. And out loud, I'll be like, yes. And then we'll spend 20 minutes looking at pictures of dogs. Um, anyway, so my second challenge is um, to pray big impossible things, right? So I want you to find something that burdens your heart, right? We know that, like, this word, like, impossible, it's not actually impossible because like there is nothing impossible with God in prayer. But I want you to find something that is seemingly impossible. So like choose something that in your power alone cannot actually happen. And I want you to pray for that. And I want you to pray persistently the way that Daniel prayed. I want you to pray fixing your mind on the things of God and humbling yourself before God so that you are occupying yourself with him and not your own abilities because we can't 
I cannot accomplish the things that I'm praying for, but God can. So that's what I want you to do. So to close out, I'm going to share with you some things that the church is praying for first, and then I'm going to let you know what I'm praying for, just like personally. So first, here are three things that the church is praying for. So first, number one, is the loss to know Jesus. And this is the lost everywhere to know Jesus. And this is City Church specifically. I think I just said the church, and I meant like our church, City Church, is praying for the lost to know Jesus. Secondly, we're praying for racial reconciliation within our country, within our world, within our city to, uh, to happen. And thirdly, we're praying for the hurting and oppressed in our world. And that is City Church's top three things that we're praying for in this season and beyond. And then for me personally, when I was writing this message, I was like, what are the top like four things that like I want to pray for in my life right now? And I was trying to challenge myself to think of like what are impossible things that like hurt my heart and that um, I can't do by myself. So my four things are an end to systemic racism in our country. Um, as a public school educator, I want access to ed excellent education for every child. Um, I want to see God move in my life in an Ephesians 4.20 way. And this verse is like, now to him who is able to do more abundantly than I can ask, think, or imagine. I'm probably misquoting that, but like, I just want to see God move more than my human brain can like think of right and then the last thing seems kind of weird but i'm gonna tell you anyway and it's just like a friend and i was inspired by this quote in this book that says what would happen if you focused your thought your prayers on one thing for one person for one month or one year so i just like didn't tell this person who might be watching today <laughs> that i'm doing this but i just like chose someone and decided like what would happen if I just like persistently prayed for them for an unspecified amount of time like I haven't decided when I'll stop but like just prayed for them so I want to challenge you to find something that burdens your heart and then or find someone something that burdens your heart and if not, if you can't think of anything like big or possible, impossible that burdens your heart in this moment, just like choose a friend and just persistently pray for them and don't tell them. Like, that's a little creepy, but like, or not, I don't know. But don't tell them and just pray for them. So I want to close today by saying, what burdens your heart? Is there something that just like when you like turn on the news or go on social media or talk to friends? Is there something that just like breaks your heart and that you feel powerless to change? And if there is, that's the thing that you should persistently pray for with fixing your mind on God, humbling yourselves before him. And if you can't think of anything in this moment, if God isn't bringing anything to your mind, then I want you to just like choose someone that you love and just Pray for them until you see God move in their life in a way that's beyond what you can ask, think, or imagine. Um, and praying with, and I want you to commit to like doing the persistent prayer that Daniel did with your mind fixed on God and humbling yourself before him. So I'm going to invite Pastor Jim to the stage while I pray us out. Um, so let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for the people that you've brought. I pray that you continue to work in our hearts and that you continue to, I pray that you just burden our hearts for the things that break your heart. I pray that you show us something that we can persistently pray for. I pray that you just help us to fix our minds on you and you show us if we have any destructive thought patterns that you want us to fix. I pray that you help us to learn how to occupy ourselves with you and I pray that you just teach us how to persistently pray so that our minds are fixed on you. 
I pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good job, Kat. Thank you. I'd give you a little side hug, but I'm supposed to social distance. <laughs> Hey, I'll just close by saying this. She gave you some really great tools uh, to use, a formula when it comes to getting into prayer. And here's the thing that I, I would just, I'll, I'll make a little quick connecting point for you. That, that formula is not something that you have to labor uh, in wondering if it works. If you will set your mind onto the things of God, if you will walk with humility, it's, it's an instantaneous connection with God, right? The delay that comes is because there is an enemy at work in the world around us, and we have to constantly be aware of that. And so for Daniel, it was 21 days before the word was able to come. So be persistent, be consistent. Don't, don't think, well, this isn't working. God's not hearing me. God is absolutely hearing you if you are in that position of humility before the Lord. He's hearing your, your prayers. He's hearing the requests of your heart. You just have to keep pressing through, and God will show up, okay? Amen? All right, guys, it is good to be with you today. I hope that you are encouraged by the word. Listen, if you do not know Jesus as Lord of your life, we want to pray with you. We'd love to connect. Uh, please, you can see myself if you're in the room today uh, online. You can even let somebody know. Uh, give us an email. Uh, we want to connect with you. And if you need to know more about the gospel, we want to share that with you. Uh, we are a church that is in prayer uh, beyond 21 days, but we are in 21 days right now. So this week, be in prayer. Be connected with the the Spirit of God. We love you guys, and we will see you next Sunday. Some of you at midweek, go change your world. Thank you for